So uh, what I thought I'd do today is just go into a bit more detail on a few of the items that I presented yesterday. Yesterday I, I felt the need to cover a very large terrain to give you an overview of a set of issues which I could not possibly persuade you of by looking at a smaller piece of that terrain. Today I'm just going to look at a handful of those slides in much more internal detail. Uh, and uh, since our th theme for the today's panel is the participatory logics of mass media, we're in fact now talking about mass media. That is to say, in the age of print, right, it is standard uh, to talk about the novel uh, uh, as a, a mass media genre of magazine in the middle of the 19th century as a mass media genre. So these are also, uh, just as plausibly, these, these paper uh, documents which count as money under certain descriptions are also mass media. So there's nothing particularly um, strange about calling them that from that point of view. Now, but the real question that I'm interested in is today is uh, what are the kinds of participation frameworks that particular specific pecuniary media project? And in particular, how are social categories of people mapped onto participant roles in, through these media? By participant roles, I just mean the reader of the, of the document, right? And whoever made the document, call that the animator of the document. Uh, by social categories, I mean, how does the document formulate the social identity and social characteristics of the one who made it? and the one who reads it and is to be its user, uh, 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 insofar as it is a type of pecuniary uh, 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 artifact. And once we begin to explore this issue, we can readily see that these documents are just as much political tracts and just as much advertisements as there are forms of money <laughs> from the point of view of our 21st century uh, 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 notional categories. So in this type of, here are three uh, of these that we talked about last, yesterday. And as I said yesterday, not almost anyone can print money at this time. Now, the, the curious thing about these three is that the, the name of the printer appears on them. So you can see at the top, right, I've uh, highlighted that, and then at the bottom you can see as well in the red highlights, right, that uh, the name of the printer appears on them. This doesn't happen in any of the colonial era uh, currencies uh, prior to this, say middle of the uh, 18th century, and it doesn't happen in the middle of the 19th century. So for some strange reason, the printer's name starts appearing right around this time. Uh, call the printer the animator of the document. In other words, the printer is the one who physically produces the document, right? Uh, now, so, okay, fine. Let's just put that aside for now that the printer's name is appearing on them and turn to the other sorts of things that are happening here. Now, each of these documents is also a chronotopic figurement of place, time, and personhood. We have to think of these documents as as not only formulating certain social categories relevant to certain times and places, but in the document itself, but also responding to certain ideas of what the time and places that they're, that they're being produced in really are. And the first thing to note is the year of publication of, of, of these documents. So the top one is 1764, and the bottom ones, both of them are 1775. Now, in fact, an eon separates these two. It just looks like about 11 years. But in fact, it's from the point of view of the socio-political organization of the polity in which they are being produced, that's an eon. Because hostilities between the colonists and the crown don't start until 1765, which is a year after the top document. So one can think of the top document as a pre-revolutionary document. The, the bottom ones in 1775, by, by the time this one is produced, several big things have happened. So the so the so-called the Boston Tea Party has happened in 1773, which is one of the first hostilities uh, uh, in, in which a, a shipment of tea, for those of you uh, uh, who may not be familiar with the phrase, is, uh, is uh, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, is destroyed by a group of people who call themselves the Sons of Liberty, who are the vanguard of the revolutionary movement. Very soon thereafter, the, the Massachusetts militia gets constituted, which is the next uh, uh, version of the Sons of Liberty. Then the Battle of Concord happens on April 19, 1775. So in other words, war has broken out. It is after those events that these bottom two documents are produced. Now, one of the interesting things about these documents is that um, <clears throat> who is understood as the principal, uh, or, in other words, the one held responsible for producing these pecuniary artifacts. So for the top document, the pre-revolutionary document, it's the crown. Um, and all of the, the, the wording of that little uh, segment which I've put highlighted in blue is completely conventional from the standpoint of colonial era uh, pecuniary media. The interesting thing about the bottom one is that the principle is not specified. That's what this null sign means. In other words, there is no appeal to any statute or assembly or law, right, that makes the bottom two uh, forms of currency uh, gives them a kind of a, a, a political uh, backing, right? Um, uh, th so there is no state <laughs> that is alluded to in the bottom two. Uh, in fact, the very idea of whether this a state or the state or which state exists in Massachusetts or in New York or in Philadelphia is entirely up for grabs at this point, right? Uh, uh, now, the next thing to notice is that the, 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 the denomination of the top one is pence. So it's pence and shillings, it's just British currency, right? For the bottom one, right, you have a, a newfangled denomination name, something called dollars, right? Which is now only beginning to catch on and is going to, of course, become exceedingly important later on. Uh, uh, then, where do these people live? The first ones, the top one, called itself issued in the province of Pennsylvania, which constitutes it as a, as a political unit <laughs> within a larger political order, which emanates ultimately from the crown. Where do the, where do the users of the bottom uh, one live? Well, they just identify it by city names. So the left one, the users live in a city called New York. The ones on the right, the users live in the city called Philadelphia, right? So in a certain sense, uh, the, the only appeal to social category membership of the, of the users is no longer membership in a political formation, but as residents of a city locale. Uh, and in fact, you might say that the entire political formation of empire and colony is in the very process of breaking down at this very time, right? Um, and in a certain sense, the colonies are in free fall from the standpoint of socio-political, stable socio-political formations. Uh, and all of this then is, all of this is, is part of the, the sense in which these documents are not just documents, they are taking footings with history, <laughs> right? And with historical events unfolding around them, right? Um, uh, now the war is over. This is 1814. The United States is firmly established as a new political order, right? Uh, uh, the federal government still lacks the, the exclusive uh, authority to issue currency, so everyone is, is still issuing currency, right? Businesses of every size and description are doing so. Uh, now, the, one of the interesting things here is that from this point on, you don't get the printer's name on any of these documents. So in other words, the distinction between the animator and the principal has dissolved. The principal has absorbed the animator. And the principal is what? It's a business. <laughs> in other words, that's the one who is held uh, accountable for or who is held or is understood to be legitimating this type of currency. Uh, and this principle or this business is called the Original Fringe and Worsted Yarn Warehouse. It's located at 125 Market Street. It issues a note for 50 cents. Uh, now, many of these kinds of uh, currency bills are used uh, at the very businesses that issue them by the people who are clients of these businesses. Now, therefore, the principle or the issuer or the business that, that 
that prints it faces a very important task. It needs to identify its target mar market of who the clientele is. <laughs> it needs to distinguish who it hopes will be its clients from the totality of persons who live in places like Philadelphia, right? Um, uh, now, how does it do that? It, it, it produces a figurement of its addressee or target market by representing moments of the process of manufacture itself. That is to say, you can see on those pictures up there, right, there are sheep being shorn, there is wool being uh, uh, made on a loom, sacks are being collected and things of this nature, right? So the harvesting of cotton and wool and their weaving on looms formulates the very process of manufacture in which the clientele has stakes. And so in that sense, it is, it is for a working class clientele in, involved uh, in this type of industry that this type of bill is designed. Now if you turn to this one, this one formulates itself as a bank. It is located in Atlanta, Georgia, issues a bill for $50. Uh, how does it formulate its addressee and clientele? It has to be indexically selective for a particular category of clientele. And what it does is now uh, 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 representing phases and moments of commercial uh, manufacture. So on the top left, you've got these muscular, muscular workmen, right? Uh, in the middle, you've got a steam locomotive. Uh, and then on the right top, you've got a steam uh, 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 steamship. Uh, now, the interesting thing about the, uh, the uh, and at the bottom, you've got an arm and hammer, right? So it's, a, it's, a, it's an emerging industrial working class for which this one is formulating, uh, 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 who this one is formulating as its addressee. Notice also that as far best as I can tell from this image, those muscular workmen at the top left, right? They're standing by something that has, that's almost like Vulcan's forge. Notice that they're, one of them is wearing a winged helmet. <laughs> so it's not just regular guys, uh, you know, working uh, on in the factories. It has a mythographic, cos uh, cosmographic element to it uh, in terms of how it's formulating uh, 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 these categories. Now, the, one of the things that happens is that as I said before, uh, all kinds of organizations are calling themselves banks. The, uh, in fact, the National Banking Act of 1883 provided, for example, that any group of five people who had enough capital could f call themselves a bank and start functioning like that. Um, in fact, at this time, d through the 19th century, there are 6,178 different types of banknotes that are produced, all with different motifs and designs. And there are about 12, uh, uh, it's like, that's probably a conservative estimate. According to a different estimate, there's more than 12,000 varieties of banknotes in this time. And the number of banks is something like 2,000 banks, right? So in fact, there's a great assortment and variety, and there's a great deal of selectivity for different kinds of target markets. So in fact, these are just businesses who are producing advertisements for their own services uh, on the very document that counts as the money token, <laughs> which their clientele will use in transactions with them. This particular uh, uh, bank calls itself the Somerset, Somerset and Worcester Savings Bank of Maryland. On the left, you've got a man petting his dog. I don't know how clear this image is uh, in this light. I don't know if you can see that. In the far left, you've got a man petting his dog. Uh, in the middle, you've got a woman milking her cows. On the right, you've got a little girl cuddling her puppies. So this is a kind of a, a, a tableau of savings-based idyllic moments of prosperity for an agrarian household, right? So once again, it's highly specific for who, its cli who, its, who the clientele is to be. Uh, um, uh, uh, this one, the Piscatagua Exchange Bank of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, takes a slightly more expansive approach. So the center panel depicts an array of milkmaids, cows, and pails in some sort of a tranquil glen of some sort in the middle. Uh, and then uh, on the right-hand side, you've got a galleon uh, 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 coming 
to the port, uh, which is the port of Portsmouth, which is the city in, ha uh, in New Hampshire where this is being made. Uh, 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 and, and so you might say that images of agrarian endeavor in the middle of panel are connected to mercantile and en endeavor abroad. With, the, with that image on the right. I mean, the, so in other words, there's a kind of a television-like narrative that is connecting these different spaces, right? Before there was TV, there was TV. And this was, in a sense, it, right? Uh, and, and what connects domestic agrarian endeavor to mercantile endeavor abroad? It's the $20 bill itself. That is the connector, you see. Uh, so from the point of view of uh, 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 this choice of, of elements of this picture, it's all very well done. But in addition to that, think of this as civil society. You've got commerce, agrarian, and, and mercantile, right? But you've also got images of William Penn, Benjamin Franklin, and George Washington looking out benignly those are, that's, those are the figurements of the state looking out on civil society. Uh, and of course, keep in mind, this is not state issue. This is not a state issue money token. This is privately issued, right? But the point is, it is that kind of cosmographic framing in which, in which this particular type of uh, 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 money token formulates itself, its business, its clients, the nature of the world in which, which it shares, with its own clients, not the whole universe, just the parts that are relevant to its own trade, right? And so on, okay. Now we talked about coins, right? And um, I talked about the general issue that, uh, that uh, from the standpoint of uh, 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 what people were doing, lots of people were making coins, but from the standpoint of the state, uh, as, as, as Thomas Jefferson wrote, coppers have never been in use. And I pointed out that both are true assertions from different positional stand, standpoints, from different sets of criteria, right? Uh, what I want to talk about is I mentioned that there, is a, that there are various coppers with some interesting sorts of inscriptions on them, and that all of these have a kind of voicing structure. So here at the bottom, at the top, you've got the Virginia copper. And in fact, this is the kind of coin that Jefferson says is not a coin, uh, but in fact it is formulating itself through a bust of King George III. Its own internal framing formulates itself as it's trying to formulate itself as a as a as a, a genuine coin, although it isn't licensed by anyone, uh, uh, right? But it is a kind of a figurement of self. The bottom one, uh, you, if you look at, there are two coins. The one on the left is 1837, and it says uh, over here it says. I am a good copper, and uh, the other part of it reads, value me as you please. Uh, and then the second one says, I cut my way uh, through, right, on the right hand side, and again, value me as you please. And these are, this is just the voice of the, of the animator, the guy, Mr. Higley is his name, by the way, uh, uh, of Connecticut in this case, right? Uh, who's just expressing his own opinions about various things. So the, here, there is no voice of the state. There is just the voice of the animator, Mr. Higley, right? But things get much more interesting and, and complicated. So here is, uh, here, if you look at the voicing structure of some of these documents, or in this case, metal coins, right? We can see that uh, these, they constitute also a kind of folk literature, and in some case, a kind of political cartoon, in some cases, a kind of broadside, in some cases, a kind of pamphlet. In other words, many of our familiar genres are blended in these, in different ways. So this one says, 1834, right at the point where President Andrew Jackson's fiscal policies had created currency shortages, this one says, uh, on the left hand side there's a picture of Andrew Jackson holding a sword and a money bag in his hand and and then it says uh, a plain system void of pomp is what it says around the circumference and on the other side it says uh, Roman firmness the Constitution as I understand it the Constitution as I understand it is actually a phrase that Andrew Jackson had used in his political speeches on his way to getting elected president so here the maker of this coin has the voiced speech of the president on the back side of the coin in a total document that is, that is attacking 
the validity of Jackson's own fiscal policies. Here's a similar kind of thing, uh, uh, again an anti-Jackson uh, uh, coin. My substitute for the United States Bank, it says on one side, there's a bust of Jackson, and then it says on the other side, uh, 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 actually you know, on the same side, my experiment, my currency, my glory. Uh, and then it goes on. Here's an even more interesting one, which is not just a coin, but a political tract that seeks the abolishment of slavery. So there is a picture of a, a woman kneeling in chains, and it says, am I not a woman and a sister? <laughs> which is voiced as her speech, the speech of the slave, right? Um, uh, and on the other side, I don't have a picture of the other side, it says, uh, United States of America, Liberty, 1838. This has actually what Bakhtin calls uh, double-voiced, very directional voicing, right? There's the voice of the state and there is the voice of the oppressed, right? Both coming, both on either side of the coin. Here is another example of a similar thing, uh, 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 though th in this case the, the voicing structure is even more elaborate. So this is not a coin. This th is a print made by the engraver, the Boston sil silversmith and engraver, Paul Revere, this is a, a print that you can buy. Uh, in fact, it says on it, engraved, printed, and sold by Paul Revere, Boston. It depicts the, so the Boston ma Massacre, as it came to be called, an incident in which the British, uh, the soldiers, uh, uh, the British soldiers opened fire on civilians who faced them as a mob, right? So this has nothing to do or with money or on any understanding. It's just a commodity you can buy in the store. Uh, this one is the interesting one, right? Here is another print made by Paul Revere, which is two shillings. It says two shillings on both sides, right? Uh, it's, it's worth two shillings. It's made in 1775. The, the part that I want to focus on is everything aside from the denomination, which is clearly two shillings. That's not in doubt. On this side, it says, it formulates itself, uh, uh, the colony of the Massachusetts Bay, right? Um, and it has, the, the whole wording uh, is completely conventional from the point of view of British era currency. On the right hand side, however, it says, um, um, uh, it has a figure of a man, right, holding a sword. Uh, around that is a, uh, issued in defense of American liberty, right? Uh, and then it has a Latin inscription, Ense petit placidem sub libertate quietum, which means by arms he seeks quiet peace under liberty, which <laughs> was quickly adopted as a revolutionary motto of the Provincial Congress. So, you see, the interesting thing about it is, if you go to that side, it is legal tender, blue. This side, it's a call to arms. That side is pecuniary media. This side is revolutionary media, if you just flip the two sides, right? So in that sense, the, the sorts of issues that we find before our conventional categories of the 21st century got settled is that, is that the very notion of what the participation frameworks are, what the process is. Is it a commercial process involving advertising? Is it a political process involving a revolution? All of those are up for grabs. Not only are they up for grabs, you get this kind of double voicing in many of these documents, right? Um, and finally, the way in which these documents or, or pecuniary media are effective in their times and places is that they make the right call as to who's going to use them. Some of them are not effective. Some of them are, right? But it's, once again, this, this struggle or tussle. And in fact, I would say that every one of these is a type of advertisement, although we no longer call uh, uh, our modern currencies advertisements. They're advertisements for the state. Every one of these is a law for someone. Every one of these is a type of mass media. Every one of these is a political tract of some kind. <laughs> Right, And once we approach it that way, uh, the naturalized assumptions that we have about what we take money to be, have become in the last uh, uh, century can be put aside when we begin to analyze what is actually happening in the world. All right, I'm done. Thanks very much.